Yeah, we are a federal agency within the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and we are primarily responsible for working with state and local coastal resource manager types. So we are the folks that provide everything from oversight in state-federal partnerships of coastal zone management and estuarine research reserves like the Ace Basin right here uh, in Beaufort, and also uh, the conservation of our corals uh, on a national basis. We also provide technical assistance, and that technical assistance comes in the form of access to a variety of data sources. So everything from remote sensing to habitat data to all different kinds of things that help us to better understand our environment. But in addition to that, we're also very actively involved in incorporating and integrating both economic and social information in the kinds of decision support tools that we feel are necessary for communities to have available so that they can make the best decisions taking into account everything that's impacting their community. If we look just at the environment without looking at the economic and social structure, we're missing two parts of a very important equation. So we have to put these things together and we provide that kind of technical assistance, the data, the decision support tools, as well as training. We do a lot of training and we work in partnership with many other folks including, for example, South Carolina Sea Grant in providing such training. And at today's event, we saw that South Carolina Sea Grant was right there front and center on the Beaufort um, adapting to sea level rise strategy, one of the partners involved in that. So we are about assisting communities very much at preferably that local level so that we are able to affect change where change actually does in fact occur and where change can actually um, be sustained. Everything shouldn't be, nor uh, will it work well with a national top-down approach. We need to be able to build it up and somewhere meet in the middle so that we have satisfaction. So I think that, that climate change is probably, and, and I don't necessarily spend a lot of time in hyperbole, but I think it is probably the most significant issue facing us as a human species today. It has been through the last 50 to 75 years in particular that we've been collecting data. Uh, we have been analyzing that data. We have been able to empirically, by observation and experimentation, show that our planet is changing. Not just changing, but changing on a very rapid basis, especially more recently. And so we need to be in a place where we can communicate these kinds of complex issues and also the significance of those issues to communities and stakeholders across the board. And I think that what's really interesting and is a challenge, but it's also an opportunity, is the ability to um, essentially not only define what a community is, but to be able to be um, respectful, essentially, and in relationship with communities. Because none of us are the same. I'm different than you. And, and communities are all different as well. They have many commonalities, but essentially we need to figure out where people are coming from. And if you think in terms of uh, value structures or beliefs, uh, traditional knowledge and practice, for example, what we're learning here in, in this engagement with the Gullah Geechee community and, and the, the broader Beaufort region, Beaufort region, and, and the way in, in which things are done, there has to be an appreciation for that. And so education and communication and engagement has to start at the relational level. And that takes time. It, it takes effort. And we need to be able to say that um, coming in in a New York minute <laughs> is not going to work, except maybe in New York. Maybe they have a short attention span. But uh, where we are is going to be defined um, as to what we can do. Well, I think that that is a, uh, a, a bit of a, again, complex question to try to answer. We as scientists are uh, as engaged in not only observing change, but we are uh, by necessity needing to understand the uncertainty in our observations and what they mean, uh, much less uh, our analyses. 
or much more so our analyses. And I think that where we have come from, especially during the Industrial Revolution, in terms of uh, the way in which society has become today, what it is, uh, is um, showing us that these inputs, especially to our atmosphere, are indeed having a impact. And I think it can be argued, and, and there are preeminent scientists who have said that we've uh, become uh, very close to, if not have already reached that tipping point. And if we were to, for example, shut off all emissions, all inputs to um, our atmosphere today from especially fossil fuels, uh, that it would take still centuries in order to have the atmosphere return to some degree of either normalcy or a different state. And I think that when we talk about tipping points, we're, we're looking at major shifts that could occur much more rapidly than otherwise expected. Major shifts in ecosystems, major shifts in where people can live and, and sustain their livelihoods, and how the environment supports that. So I think tipping point is both a, an, an environmental, uh, philosophically based term, but it's also a scientifically uh, important term for us to understand and to appreciate what it means to have reached a tipping point. I think it's, um, it's a bit, uh, dangerous to run around talking about tipping points without factual information, without responsible inquiry. And it's not just the scientists that, that actually are responsible for that, but getting back to your earlier question about education and communication and engagement, everybody needs to be aware of and able to own the nature of these issues and to be uh, informed enough and responsible enough in order to then respond as well. Science is able to speak relatively well for what it uncovers. That is the, the process of inquiry. Uh, it's also a very responsible process of inquiry. So we need to be as clear and certain about the things that we do say uh, publicly or in somewhat arcane journals where science is, is read and conducted. And I think that we have a responsibility to um, be engaged in the public discourse. I think that we must do that with confidence. I would say that those that are perhaps in denial, as you said, are not necessarily uh, people that are, are bad, good, or indifferent. They are simply processing information in their way. And we are all individuals. Uh, we are, I think, in, in many ways, uh, influenced by what we read and hear and believe and the tribe that we identify with and things like that. So denial, in my view, is, is neither good nor bad. It just is. Acceptance is either neither good nor bad. It just is. But what we do with it and what we believe needs to be done, I think, is the important question to ask and to uh, deal with. And so um, I, I think that those that uh, deny that the environment itself is changing, it's a bit hard to, um, to say that with a straight face when in fact we see the impacts occurring uh, more regularly, uh, more frequently, and in some cases with greater intensity as well. So come to your own conclusion. Well, in, in terms of climate change, the, the globe is impacted. We are looking at temperature increases. Some of those temperature increases are leading to, for example, a uh, increase in sea level because of thermal expansion and melting of ice. Some of the temperature increases are leading to extended drought. So it's not just a coastal issue. Drought can occur on islands in the Pacific, in the Caribbean, and throughout the interior US. And we know that when we have drought, we're going to be in a water-limited status. And because we're in a water-limited status, we're going to be affecting uh, the interior breadbasket of the U.S. in terms of agricultural food production, food security. We're also going to be doing things in terms of water management that um, can potentially affect ecosystems downstream. So if we think about what occurs, for example, in the eastern region of the U.S., we've gone through in the last decade plus a rather extended period of drought. We're out of that now. 
But during that period of time, water management was such that um, the way in which the, the water is regulated is through a series of dams. Some of those dams lead down to the coast, for example, Al Apalachicola Bay or Mobile Bay. And when water is restricted in the river flow into those bays and the circulation within those bays, that affects the basic productivity of those bays. So think in terms of reduced shellfish um, productivity, both shrimp as well as mollusks, oysters, all of those things that drive the economic engine. So the, the, the fact of the matter is that we are in an interconnected ecosystem-based social and economic feedback loop. And what happens when the, the climate changes is not going to be just a coastal response or a coastal impact. It's going to be a global response and a global impact. With increasing temperature, we may see uh, more vector-borne diseases moving through the different strata, both the ocean environment as well as the atmosphere and even the terrestrial environment. So uh, what we're talking about here today largely is coastal in nature, but uh, this is a community, and I mean the big Catholic community of the globe, issue that, that we have to deal with, and uh, there will be impacts throughout.